In this unit, we're going to talk about respiratory viral infections. These are viral infections that infect the respiratory tract, and that's shown here in pink. We're going to talk mostly about two of these guys, influenza and RSV, but there's a whole lot more just to give you an idea. There's human metanumovirus, adenovirus, parainfluenza, rhinovirus, coronaviruses. So there's a ton, and you don't need to remember those names, but just know that there's a lot. So what do these viruses generally do? Well, we already said they infect the respiratory tract, and based on that, we can actually pretty much figure out what kind of clinical presentations they can have. So starting from the top, they can infect the nasal cavity, and so that'll give you rhinitis, or inflammation of the nose. They can also infect the pharynx, which is back here, and that'll give you pharyngitis. And they can infect the larynx, which is right here, and that'll give you laryngitis. Now, if you'll notice, all this is kind of in the upper part of this respiratory tract. So we actually refer to an infection that affects this part as an upper respiratory tract infection. And the symptoms are going to be things you're very familiar with because we've all had these infections many, many times, like runny nose, cough, and sore throat. But actually, respiratory viral infections are not always so mild. And actually, they kill up to 4 million people a year. And they don't do it by giving you a runny nose, cough, and sore throat. So how do they do it? Well, by giving you a lower respiratory tract infection. And the first example of that is something we call croup. Now what is croup? Croup is when you get infection down here in the trachea, sometimes also the bronchi and the larynx, and that infection makes the walls of the trachea swell. And because they swell, it becomes difficult for air to get through and down into the lungs. Now croup happens mostly to little kids, and when they have it, you can hear them actually have difficulty breathing. And that sound we refer to as strider. And it sounds something like That's the best impression I can do. Now what other more severe infections can you get? Well, if you get infection of these very small airways deep in the lung, these are called bronchioles, and so when you get infection of those, it's bronchiolitis. Now just like croup, this makes it difficult for air to get down into the alveoli, which we'll draw here. And the last kind of infection you can get is actually when those alveoli themselves are infected. And that is called pneumonia. You're probably used to thinking of pneumonia as a bacterial thing, but you can get viral pneumonia too. So as we were saying, all of these are examples of lower respiratory tract infection. And the important thing about those is that in addition to all other kinds of symptoms, they can cause respiratory failure. So these are the main ways that viruses infect the respiratory tract, but there's a few more things that we should mention. The first is that, what do we have up here? Well, up here we have eyes, hopefully. And the eyes are actually lined by mucous membranes, and it turns out that a lot of the viruses that infect the respiratory tract can also infect the mucous membranes of the eyes. And there they give you conjunctivitis. Now the very last thing we need to talk about is that a viral infection can actually cause a bacterial infection. This is something that we call bacterial superinfection. And the reason it happens is that the virus damages the host defenses and makes us more susceptible to bacteria. And in particular, we have something called the mucociliary escalator, which just refers to the fact that there are tons of little cilia that line most of our respiratory tract which are constantly carrying mucus plus bacteria and whatever else happens to be there out of the alveoli, out of the lungs, and up to the upper airway where you can cough that stuff out or swallow it. So normally bacteria are quite literally lifted out of the lung. But when you get a viral infection, the viral infection can actually damage the mucociliary escalator and therefore allow bacteria to hang out down here in the alveoli and replicate and give you a bacterial infection. And the reason this is called a super infection is not because it's super powerful, but because super means on top of. So it's a bacterial infection on top of a viral infection. So now you know a little bit about how respiratory viral infections present, and let's talk briefly about how you actually make a diagnosis. So I hope the first thing that comes to mind is clinically. You make the diagnosis based on the symptoms of all these conditions that we've described here. But let's say you make a diagnosis of viral respiratory tract infection. How do you know which virus it is? Well, the first answer to that is, if it's an upper respiratory tract infection, and it's just like a mild cold, do you really need to know which virus it is? The answer is you don't need to know, especially because we don't have treatments for the vast majority of them. 
But if it's a lower respiratory tract infection, and especially if it's in someone who's hospitalized or really young or immunocompromised, then it's a lot more serious. And in that case, we probably do want to know exactly what virus is causing it, because that way we can be sure that we know we're dealing with the virus. And also because that way we know what kind of isolation we should use for that patient to make sure they don't give the virus to someone else. So to find out exactly which virus we're dealing with, what we do is we take a little swab, a little sample of saliva from the pharynx, and we send it for a respiratory PCR panel. What is this? Well, you probably know that PCR detects genetic material. And so the respiratory PCR panel actually looks for RNA or DNA of a whole bunch of viruses at once. And actually it's mostly RNA because most respiratory viruses are RNA viruses. And you can remember that because respiratory starts with an R. And here's an example of what one of these viral panels might look like. And as you can see, it checks for a whole bunch of viral targets at once. And it'll tell you whether the genetic material of these viruses is in your sample. And it also checks for a couple of bacteria that are hard to detect otherwise with usual cultures. And that's useful because if you have a bacterial infection, you definitely want to know because you can treat it with antibiotics.